John chapter 10. We're going to begin reading in verse 9. We're just going to read a few verses here. I'm not going to deal a lot with the context of the passage. I think most of you would understand what Christ is saying here. You want to try to take the passage to get a thought, at least going in that direction. John chapter 10. Thankful each of you are here tonight. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight that we can assemble back in your house. What a privilege and honor that it is. And I know we're so unworthy even to be able to call you our Father, to uh, be able to experience the great love that you've shown toward us. And uh, yet I pray that uh, we would be grateful and thankful for that and realize that you have given us a work to do as your children. We can do it with joy, not grief. And Heavenly Father, just bring our minds in from the things of the world for a few minutes tonight. You know even the thought that, uh, that I feel led to try to get across to the people. And I know I can only take it so far. I can't, do it, I can't even take it to the ears without your help. But I pray that you'll take it past the ears to the very heart. And I pray that we could leave here tonight uh, uh, having a greater burden and zeal and desire to do your work. Heavenly Father, we uh, realize there's many that are lost. There's more that's lost than those who are saved. And uh, I pray that we could uh, understand that you've given us the gospel, and if the gospel be hid, it's hid from them that are lost. You've given us the ministry of reconciliation, and uh, I pray that we would have a zeal and desire to reach lost sinners for you and realize there's great joy that comes along with being a soul winner. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. John chapter 10. Let's begin reading in verse 9. We'll read down through verse 13. I am the door by me if any man enter in he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy I am come that they might have life and that they might have it that is that life more abundantly I'm the good shepherd the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep entirely and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's read down through verse 13 now. And really what I want to deal with is the last couple of verses that uh, I read, verses, well, verses 11, 12, and 13, and what we find in these three verses of Scripture, you have a contrast here. We understand when you compare something, you look at the similarities. When you contrast something, you look at the differences. And uh, the, the contrast that we see here is the contrast between the shepherd and the hireling. The shepherd and the hireling. And I want to try to use that tonight to get a thought uh, on our hearts, the thought that the Lord has, has given me. Now, for those people in that day... This was an example that they would be very familiar with. We know that there were many sheep in that day. That to be sh a shepherd was a common occupation of that day. And the job of the shepherd was one thing. And that was to care for the sheep. That's what a shepherd does. I, I know you understand that. But when you think about a shepherd taking care of the sheep, that involved many things. And I want to mention just a few things that that involved. Uh, first of all, that it involved them providing the sheep with adequate food and water. I think we all understand that sheep are very needy creatures. And there's very few things that they can do on their own. Really about the, the probably the, the thing that sheep are best at is getting in trouble. That's why they need a shepherd. And so the shepherd, that it was his job to make sure that uh, he had the knowledge of where the good grazing was. He had the knowledge of the times of the year. He knew where to go. He knew where the water was, the still waters where the sheep would drink. And so he provided them with that. He was also to provide them with proper medical care. Uh, no doubt that there were parasites that would affect the sheep. There were times that the sheep would be injured. No doubt there were times the sheep would need help, maybe giving birth, that they would require assistance. And the shepherd would be able to assist them in doing all those things. Also, the shepherd would provide them with direction. The sheep didn't know where to go. Uh, as I said, the, the, the thing that sheep are best at is just getting themselves in trouble. 
And uh, so that the, the shepherd would be the one to, to lead the sheep. He didn't drive the sheep, but he led the sheep. That he would call them, and they were to follow him because that they knew his voice. Well, really what I want us to point out, or what I want to point out to you as the role of the shepherd was security and safety. That's one of the most important jobs of the shepherd, was he was to make sure that the sheep were safe and sound. And uh, I was telling Brother Rodney today at lunch that uh, I've had a varmint in my chicken yard uh, for the last week and a half or so, and I got rid of one of them, and I've, evidently I've got another one. And uh, so I may be sleeping in the chicken yard tonight uh, because they're <laughs> eliminating them pretty quick. But nevertheless, that the reason I said that was this, everything likes chicken. Does it not? I mean, when you think about, I, I know what's getting in there, it's a coon, a raccoon. And, uh, but for a few days, when I didn't know what it was, uh, you know, a lot of things went through my mind. And I would look at how the chicken was killed and where it was located and maybe the, the holes that were there for something to get in because there's so many things that would like to kill those chickens. And lambs or sheep are the same way. Everything likes mutton. I don't like it. I've eaten it before. But the animals do. And especially that little tender lamb. Uh, you, you think about David as he went out and he fought uh, Goliath. What was it that gave him confidence to be able to fight Goliath? It was the fact that when he was a shepherd, he said the lion and the bear came. And what did they do? They took a little lamb out of the flock and they put it in their mouth and David said he went after them and he got that little lamb out of their mouth and he slew that lion and he slew that bear and because God gave him the strength and the ability to do that that he knew that this uncircumcised Philistine was going to be no trouble so the lion was a uh, was a predator of the sheep the bear was a predator of the sheep when you go and read in the book of Isaiah concerning the, the the millennium the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth and that's gonna be such a wonderful time I look forward to that <coughs> but what does it say it said the lamb and the wolf would lie together the lamb and the wolf would lie together why does it say that it's it's Letting us know that things are going to be different in that day. That that curse up off, the, off the ground will be lifted. And there will be peace among even the animal kingdom that we don't have today. And so you think about the wolf. You think about the lion. You think about uh, the bear. All of these things would be uh, predators. And so to be a good shepherd, not only did the shepherd have to have knowledge... I'm getting somewhere with this. Not only did the shepherd have to have knowledge, he had to know where the grazing grounds were. He had to know where the still waters were. He had to know uh, how, how to treat that injured sheep. He had to know how to help that sh maybe that sheep out that was giving birth that needed assistance. All of these things that, and, and many other things, no doubt that the shepherd had to know, he, th that was just part of it. And so not only did he have to have knowledge, and he had to have ability but at any time brother Allen at any time he could be faced with a lion or he could be faced with the bear or he could be faced with the wolf and those coming for one reason and that is to take that lamb out of the flock and so at that point he had to make a choice didn't he that one keeping the sheep no matter how much knowledge he had no matter how much ability that he had when that when that lion or that wolf or that bear would come and that his his goal was to come and to steal that lamb out of the flock at that point the knowledge and the ability didn't really matter did it he had to make a choice Either he was going to go and he was going to engage those predators and he was going to put his life on the line in order to rescue that lamb or that he would flee and he would go the other direction and leave the lamb on its own and let the lamb be killed and let the sheep be scattered. And that was a choice uh, that he had to make. Now let's go back to verse 11 and 12. I said all that to get back to this. You think about those predators, you think about that situation. As that, as that lion or that wolf or that bear would come to prey on that flock. He said in verse 11, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. 
But you read in verse 12, but he that is an hireling, what is an hireling? It's one who has been hired. It's one who has been employed. The sheep don't belong to him. He's just been hired by the shepherd or by the owner of the sheep to care for them in his place. Maybe the shepherd was unable to be out there. Maybe he had some other, uh, something else he had to tend to. Maybe there was a sickness in his family, whatever the case might be, and he hired someone to take care of the sheep. It said the good shepherd would give his life for the sheep, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd. Notice this statement, who's on the sheep or not. They don't belong to him. It says when he seeth the wolf coming, what does he do? He turns tail and runs. Because a wolf can kill a man. A lion can kill a man. A bear can kill a man. He turns and he flees. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Why does he do that? It tells us in verse 13. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. So you got a contrast here. The shepherd, the one who's, who the sheep belong to, it said he's going to give his life. He's going to do whatever it takes to protect those sheep. But that hireling, that he is going to flee. What is the difference? Here's the difference, and this is what I want to preach on for just a few minutes tonight. One's heart's in it, and one, one's heart's not in it. The shepherd, he has it at heart. He cares for his sheep. They belong to him. They mean something to him. They're important to him. The hireling, he's just there because he has to be there. One is under obligation to be there. The, the, the hireling has to come because he has made an agreement with the owner that I'll, I'll be there. And I'm going to get paid so much money. But for the shepherd, it's his privilege to be there, isn't it? Those are his sheep. That's what he enjoys. He has them in his heart. I want to ask you a question tonight. Just a very simple question, a very simple thought. Try to provoke some thought among us tonight. And this is the thought of the message. I want to ask you this. Is your heart in it? Is your heart in it? I want you, all of us tonight to answer that question. Is your heart in it? Are you just going through the motions because you have to? Or do you count it all joy to have a part in the work of the Lord? What's your answer tonight? Paul made this statement in Colossians chapter 3. He said, whatsoever you do, do it how? Heartily. Do it with all your heart. Do it because you care. Do it because your heart's in it. Do it because it means something to you. Don't just do it because you have to. Don't do it because someone expects you to. Don't do it because, you know, if I don't do it, some people have the attitude, well, I'll do it, but the only reason I'm doing it is because nobody else will do it. You're a hireling. And I'm not trying to be ugly tonight. I'm just stating the facts. If we're doing what we're doing for the Lord, the place that we're filling for the Lord, if the only reason we're doing it is because we feel like nobody else will do it, then that's all we are is a hireling. Sunday school teachers, is your heart in it? Is your heart in it? Those of you that help with the young people, is your heart in it? Those of you that help them with singing, those of you, of you or, or those of us, I, I help them. Those of us that help them with their classes on Wednesday night, those who lead singing, those who play the instruments, by the time he's church clerk, building superintendent, security team, Sunday school superintendent, pastor, all the officers of the church. I want us to ask ourselves, is our heart in it? Why are we doing it? Is our heart in what we're doing? I thought about a man that passed away been a year or two now. Uh, I had the opportunity to get to know him when my daddy pastored the church down at Loosedale. And I, I had, I mean, I had known the man all my life, but uh, 
I really got to know him well during that time. I was a teenager, and uh, this man loved to sing. If there's anybody that ever had a, had a desire and, and found joy in singing, this man did. You know what I found out when I got there and got to know him better? He couldn't read the first note on the page. And, and I, I'll just be honest with you, didn't really have that good of a voice. But I've never known anybody that inspired people to sing like he inspired people to sing. And I believe with all my heart, and he was song leader there at that church until he died, in fact, that uh, probably been four or five years ago now, he had, he'd had a leg that had been giving him a lot of trouble and he had diabetes and they ended up having to take a leg off. And uh, the last four or five years he led singing in a wheelchair. But it didn't slow him down, didn't stop him. With very little ability, and I'd say that to his face, I'm not putting him down, with very little ability, very little just natural talent, but a love for it. That man was a blessing to so many people. Why? His heart was in it. You couldn't go to that church and see him up there leading singing and leave and say, he's just doing it because nobody else will do it. He did it from the heart. Let me contrast that. And I'm going to use just a different, I'm going to use a secular example. Several weeks ago, I was at a high school football game. Our Stone County football, and uh, there was a young man on the team that I knew was sort of struggling with, you know, whether he wanted, really wanted to be out there or not. And, uh, I, I just really questioned, you know, whether, he, whether his heart was in it. But he, he started that night, and he was playing on the offensive line, and probably the beginning part of the second quarter, our quarterback threw an interception. On a, is a pretty, pretty long throw down the middle of the field and uh, there was a return. And those of you that are familiar with football, you know they always make the statement when there's an interception return, you know he's got uh, fat guys and quarterbacks chasing him. Because that's who's left usually when, it, when there's an interception. The offensive lineman and the quarterback try to tackle him. And uh, so sure enough, he gets the interception, he's coming back and there's offensive line, there's fat guys and quarterbacks chasing him. And uh, this boy I'm talking about was on the offensive line. And, and I, I thought about something real quick. I said, I want to see if he's going to put his nose in there and try to make the tackle. And I saw him run toward the, the defender was going back down the sideline. He was in the middle of the field. I saw him take off toward the sidelines. And then about five yards before he was going to meet the ball carrier, I saw him check up. He just backed off. But Allen, he didn't want to stick his nose in there. It wasn't worth it to him. And that's okay. Uh, not, it, it's not for everybody. But Brother Joe Michael, I knew right then, he's useless out there on that football t field. Hey, I'm not putting, it, I'm not putting, you know, my, my help, I'm not putting my body on the line to try to tackle this guy. He had two or three blockers in front of him. I mean, he, he was going to get hit if he went in there and he just backed up. And evidently the coach saw it too because next possession he wasn't out there. And the next week I heard he had quit the team. Well, that's what he needed to do. And I'm not, I'm not casting any reflection upon him, but his heart wasn't in it. His heart wasn't in it. He was just out there maybe because somebody else wanted him to be out there, whatever the case might be. And so he was very, 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 very little. Really he was doing no good. Probably a detriment to the team. Let's go back to our example of the, of the hireling and the shepherd. I want to ask you this question tonight. Is a flock of sheep going to thrive with a hireling? Is a flock of sheep going to thrive with a hireling taking care of them? I believe every one of you would answer that no. A flock of sheep is never going to thrive with a hireling. They may exist, they may survive, but they will not thrive. Why not? Because the hireling 
is going to do just enough to get by, isn't he? He's going to do just enough to get by. He's going to do just enough to keep the owner of the shepherd off of him. He's going to do just enough to make it appear as if he's doing his job. But ultimately, he doesn't care for the sheep. He doesn't care for the sheep. Now you think about the shepherd on the other hand. That shepherd's going to put great time. He's going to put great thought. He's going to put great effort into the sheep. Is he? Is he not? Sure he is. He's going, to, he's going to spend his time awake at night, lie, lying there in that, in that pasture, looking up at the stars, thinking about how I, can, how I can be a better shepherd. Where's the places I can take them where they'll get their greatest growth? How can I, you know, how can I lead them uh, to, to, to uh, greener pastures? What can I do to improve these sheep? It's going to be something near to him and dear to him. And I'm going to tell you something else. That hireling's going to be disappointed when he feels like he's let down the sheep on him. He's going to be disappointed when he feels like I have let down the sheep. There's a better pasture I should have gone to. I made the wrong decision. I brought them here, and they're not going to be able to get as much here as they would have over there. And, and, and that's going to hurt him. It's going to grieve him. Why? Because he cares for the sheep. What's going to happen if there's one that's straying? If there's one who's gone off? What's the hireling going to say? I don't care unless, he, unless the owner comes looking for him and I get in trouble. <laughs> but that shepherd, he's going to go, he's going to search, he's going to look, he's going to listen, he's gonna, he may try to maybe follow a trail, whatever the king may be, ask other shepherds, have you seen the, sh the sheep that I'm missing? He's going to go after him. Why? Because he cares for him. His heart's in it. His heart's in it. Tonight I want to ask us, let's just get, bring it right down to where we are. In the place that the Lord has put you, are you a shepherd or a hireling? How much thought, how much time, how much effort do you put into the sheep? We tend to, we, we usually refer to that as a burden. And I think that's a good word for it. Do you have a burden for those you teach? Do you have a burden for the church? Do you have a burden for those precious children that you're maybe teaching Sunday school to, helping with music, teenagers, adults, whoever it might be? Let me ask you this. When you feel like that you failed, does it bother you? It doesn't bother the hireling as long as he gets his paycheck. If it doesn't bother us when we feel like we failed, then our heart's really not in it. If it doesn't bother us when those we teach are not there, when we feel like that maybe those that we're responsible for when they're drifting off or we see them going in a, in a direction they don't need to be going, if that doesn't bother us, our heart's not in it. I've made this statement to you before, and I know it's hard to understand if you're not a pastor, but I've had a lot of young preachers ask me, I have them call me from time to time, Brother Brent, how do I know if it's time for me to leave a church? And I always answer them the same way, when you don't have a burden for them anymore. When, when it no longer is important to you, when it no longer bothers you when, when, when you, when you don't stay awake at night worrying and concerned about them, it's time to go. It's time to leave. Why? That's evident your heart is not in it. The burden 
is gone. And that's something a pastor must have. It's something a Sunday school teacher must have. Brother Tommy, it's something, even as a clerk, you must have a burden for this church. Song, song leaders, Sunday school superintendents, you, gotta have a, you must have a burden. It must be real. It must be important to you. Is your heart in it? The shepherd's heart's in it because those sheep are important to him. Was the heart of Jesus in his work when he was here upon this earth? You bet it was. Jesus Christ had a heart for his, for not only for his people, but he had a heart for all people. How do we know that? <laughs> And not, not just because he worked tirelessly, but he said that when he looked out upon them, that he had compassion upon them. He saw them as sheep having no shepherd, and he wept over them, and he, he, he would stay up all night praying for them. And, and it burdened him, it grieved him in his heart when they wouldn't listen. His heart was in it. You remember Nehemiah? As he went to Jerusalem, he saw the condition that Jerusalem was in, and he encouraged the people to get busy. What did it say about the people? They had a mind to work. The heart was in it. They cared. And because they had a heart to work, it didn't matter if times got difficult. It didn't matter if circumstances were hard. It didn't matter if there were those that were trying to hinder them and stop them. It was in their heart, and they had a mind to do it. They had a mind to work, and it said just in 52 days, the wall was built to the half thereof because the people had a mind to work. Listen to me, church. It's not always going to be easy. There's going to be times of discouragement. There's going to be times when you just got to keep going even when it's hard. Listen to me tonight. Th these that's gotten married and moved off and these that's gone to college, I miss them. I miss them. Uh, in a lot of ways, it, you know, feel like part of us missing. But that don't mean we stop. That don't mean we give up. That don't mean we, we back off on our efforts. Not, not at all. That means we redouble our efforts. We, 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 we work harder. We have a, a greater burden, a greater concern. That's just part of it. There's going to be ebbs and flows up and down. But you've got to continue. Even when it's hard. You think it was easy for Nehemiah and those folks? No. All kind of adversity faced them. But they had to continue. Had to keep going. We make this statement. We're going to try to come to a close. When Paul and Barnabas went to Antioch, and they went there and it said they had seen the grace of God among those people. I want you to notice what they did. Let me, let me just turn over there and read it. In, in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 11. It says this in verse 23. Speaking of Paul, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them all. He exhorted them. The, the word ex exhort, remember, it, it, he encouraged them. Uh, and it's even stronger than just, he inspired them. He, he, he begged them. And this is what he begged them to do. That with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord and cleave unto the Lord with purpose of heart that they would have a burden they would, ha they would have it in their heart to serve the Lord to cleave for the Lord tonight you may say brother Brent my heart's just not in it my heart's not in it I'm just going through the motions I need to just give, give it up. I need to let somebody else do it. Hold on just a minute. I want you to do something for me first. I want you to do this first. I want you to ask God to give you a heart for it.
Ask God to give you a heart for it. God can give you a heart for it. He can increase that burden and that zeal and that desire that he, he can bring you back to where you need to be. He can get your heart in it. Ask God to do that. Here's why. What we do here is the greatest work in the world because it's the Lord's work. There's nothing greater than to be able to teach children about the Word of God, teach children the Word of God, teach them about the Savior, Jesus Christ. Teach them how to, you know, how to sing and how to worship, prepare them uh, to, to be useful in the service of the Lord. Everything that we do as a church is so vitally important. We need a heart for it. Do you have a heart for it? Do you have a heart? Is your heart in it? And what you're doing. Our heart needs to be in it. And I'm thankful that the Lord has continued to give me a burden and a heart for you. And it's my desire to, to, to be what I need to be. And so when I'm worrying, when I'm fretting, I don't enjoy that. But at least that's evidence that God's given me that at least your heart's in it. But my heart could be in it more. You pray for me, it could be in it more. We could all have a heart for the work of the Lord. We'll have a verse of a song.